My name is Barb McKay. I'm here today because my son Tommy Booth disappeared and was found drowned in 2008. Since 1997, hundreds of college-aged men have gone missing. They are later found drowned in a body of water. Near where most of the bodies are recovered, smiley faces. And I'm here today to try to get a little more info onto what happened to my son. It's really hard to live without him. He was my baby. He was the glue, really, that held our family together. I want to know what happened. I, you know, you need that closure. And at this point, that's the most I can hope for. Well, so good to meet you. I didn't catch your name. My name's Barb McKay. Awesome. It's lovely to meet you. You too. Well, today I'm here for obviously a pretty unique reason, and I'll just kind of communicate everything that comes through. So I'm in a scribble, um, but no pressure. So I'm just going to see what we can here. And we'll go from there. Um, information can kind of come in and uh, be a little overwhelming, so I'm going to try to kind of dissect it and give each piece of information. Okay. One of the main emphasis that I'm putting on is a reference to this younger individual who would have died tragically. And I feel like that's obviously a big area of emphasis. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing was before I even got here today, there was a very distinct feeling of like, <laughs> I better come through or I better make a connection. It was almost like I'm waiting. And there was this <laughs> feeling of like waiting before I even got here today. I do want you to know too, this individual had a lot to look forward to. So in the way this comes across, I just want you to know this does not in any way, shape, or form feel like a suicide to me. There's a very distinct reference to like the day of, or in a 24-hour period. Um, they're kind of, this feels like almost clairaudient. I go from being in a very loud place to being in a very quiet place. Mm -hmm. It's putting a very alone feeling with this, almost like, oh, I'm kind of getting rid of people. Like, I kind of want to get out of here, <laughs> is kind of the way I would describe it. Just, the feeling is either like leaving a, a place because it's too loud, or hey, like, I need some quiet time. Um, I, I understand. OK. The noisy place was he went out to a bar with eight other people to celebrate somebody's 21st birthday. And they all left. And the person that was supposed to give him a ride home said he couldn't find him when it was time to go. On January 19th, 2008, 24-year-old Tommy Booth went drinking in a bar with a group of friends. 14 days later, his body was recovered in a creek directly behind the bar. The medical examiner ruled his death a probable drowning. One thing that is coming to mind, they're having me talk about cognizance awareness. It's a feeling of like, uh, I should know how to get from point A to point B, like where I'm at. But for some reason, I feel confused. His mindset didn't feel clear before he transitioned. And it's just because of something that would have been in his system that to me, it feels like something he would not have been used to dealing with or metabolizing. It feels like my body even. I, I'm feeling it more in my legs. I feel kind of like numb. It feels mm -hmm. like having difficulty walking in some capacity. So that's definitely more than just taking a drink. No, that makes sense. And, and it is questionable. It would obviously imply that someone did this. Well, we think he was drugged. Tommy could hold his liquor. So when he said that it felt like something more than I knew that Tommy didn't really do drugs. He was more of a drinker. So that validated for me that um, this wasn't just an accident. Hmm. This is interesting. Yeah, names are, are one of the things where when they come through, I like to just say them. But do you know of any like Roberts in the family or any strong R, like Robert sounding names, Robs or Bobs or? Yeah. OK, who would that be? one of the kids that he was with that night. OK. It could just be an indication that this person was around beforehand, but there's just a, an emphasis there. And actually, I think it was Rob was the only one that had called him gotcha. that night because yeah. he wasn't there. I just feel like Rob might have more answers in some capacity or have something more that could be valuable to know. So two things. OK. They're having me bring up the tragedy, tragedy, tragedy. Like, this literally just keeps coming in. Let me figure out who this is, because it's a very insistent thing. It's like one of the main reasons why I'm supposed to be here today. It's like dying at a weird time would be male. It's basically a feeling of like, it's not fair that my life's taken from me when it is. That's exactly right. They are having me bring up, um, I'm going to kind of talk about like what happened in the time leading up to his passing. 
Uh, there's some reference to um, like buying a new car, getting a new car. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. He had just gotten one before. Okay. Yeah. There's a trip basically that this individual had planned on going on, mm -hmm. and there's this feeling of like, oh my god, I am not able to go on this trip <laughs> because this has happened to me. And there's a feeling of like, I don't want people to like put their lives on hold because of what happened to me. Aww. But there's this feeling of like, I was like looking forward to like, this was like a get together, like yeah, the trip, like the big definitely thing. Definitely was. I was hoping to make a connection with a really dear friend who had recently passed away. He was such a generous man, happy. Um, he brought such a light to any room. He would light up a room um, and he was loving and he lived his life to the fullest. And it was of course a shock to everyone. You know, as Tyler stated, he was planning a trip and had bought a car and um, that of course validated that he was talking about our dear friend. Question, extremely question marks. There's a feeling of like more than one person being around at the time that I die. There's something with this where it's like, we're having more of a minor thing and then you kill me. Ooh. Yeah. It's a lot in the way this is coming in. That makes sense. It's like, there's just this feeling of like needing us to know justice will be served. Mm. But I don't feel like justice has been served fully yet. It's popping in. Okay. There's a child that's coming through as well. And this is what's confusing me. This is a female child. She's referencing to the fact that her passing was abrupt and immediate. Mm -hmm. She's acknowledging that she was not conscious at the time that she passed away. And that's the significance that she's bringing forward. She's sweet, she's beautiful, she's lovely, but she was not conscious when she died. And that is something for her that was a relief because she wasn't aware of her passing. She's referencing, this isn't family. This isn't family. This mm -hmm. does not feel like family. So I, I'm, I'm not, whereas I am gonna connect to family, this isn't family, this is separate. This is a child that unfortunately passed. This is the weirdest thing. Uh, there's just a reference to Joseph, 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 Joseph. Joseph. Oof, like I'm getting actually kind of un uncomfortable. Okay. This is the weirdest thing. She was shot. Oh, I do know, I do know. Okay, who, who would this be? Because Joseph did this, Joseph did this. I don't know his name, I, but I, it could be very well his name. It's a little girl who was around 10 years old who was shot and then her, wow. we, we put her funeral together. Was there a eulogy? We did more than one person do a eulogy? I did the eulogy. Do you eulogy. have a sister? My sister did the eulogy. Okay, that's the connection. Wow, oh my God, I got goosebumps, whoa. I'm like, I'm like really, really, Oh my really God, like, wow. Bringing up a younger thing here, so give me one sec. Like a okay. passing that happened huh, too early. Um, okay. I would consider the situation kind of tragic. There's a very selective way that this individual is presenting themselves when it came to what they showed emotionally and what they showed mentally. And so in that sense, there's almost a feeling of like an isolative element to this. He's basically having me acknowledge um, that there would be questions around this passing because of the basically where it would have happened. And he's having me acknowledge himself and he puts himself in the context of being alone and like really feeling like in the way this comes across, like in the time before in the last 24 hours of life, there's a feeling of like question marks in the way that this is kind of happening, but that there would have been indications somehow on like a soul level of something's going to happen, I'm not going to be here. That would have happened when this person was alone. So the feeling is, had they not been alone, there might have been a discussion about it or like, hey, you know, yeah. something's up, but I, they didn't really have that opportunity. Is it a negative feeling or a positive feeling? It comes or across just unresolved. In life, it would have been an unresolved feeling. In death, I believe that this individual has came to terms with this. Do you know of anybody who passed away who would have fit the bill? Yes, Jared. He was my uncle, and um, he wasn't very well mentally, and they put him in a home, and there's some question over whether it was suicide or an accident. Right. So, sense. like, it's it was left very unresolved, and it was very painful for the family at the time. Yeah. There's a big question mark around, like, his death because nobody was there. Yeah. That makes sense. That would be the isolation bit as well, and right. staying away. Yeah, wow, that makes a lot of sense. I think the feeling that came across wasn't that he had any anger towards his passing. The feeling was basically, 
in life had he had to have continued on, the feeling is being kind of mentally frustrated, that passing away for him was to some extent, you know, a relief and, and he yeah. had a sense of peace and he has that and that hopefully will provide comfort to the family. Let me see. Thank you. What is this? Uh, hmm. The only impression that they're having me convey is an acknowledgement of there being, being questions about when it comes to the circumstances and how this went, if, oh God, how do I put this? It's, it's like really rough to convey, but like, but there's this placement of responsibility. One person wasn't involved in the other person passing. The exact symbol is, is kind of a reference to another reading that I gave where unfortunately like a, a man contributed to his passing and his wife's passing. And it's kind of that type of a feeling. But that's incredibly hard to relay and to, to get into, you know, because it's so sensitive. But does that make sense? In, yeah, in reverse. Yeah, but okay. Not his choice, her choice. Her choice, yeah. My grandfather taught her how to use a gun. And um, she ended up shooting him and then uh, shooting herself. It isn't like a um, car accident thing. It's not that. But they're talking about a vehicle, but putting this around someone's like last moments, one's life. It feels weird. Does that mean anything? Yeah, um, oh, my dad, he, uh, he had broke his back and he happened to have a really rare uh, blood disorder that kept him from healing. Similar to hemophilia, it doesn't allow you to clot your blood. And so he was slowly, for years getting platelet transfusions and trying to put rods in his back, everything, and eventually he said, you're gonna be a paraplegic and then a quadriplegic and then you're gonna die. And there's nothing we can do about it. And so um, my dad decided to take matters in his own hands because he was in a huge amount of pain every day. Um, he couldn't work anymore. He felt like he was just a drag on the family and um, he was very much like a person who takes care of everyone. and. Um, he drove his car out and uh, he put a hose in the exhaust. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was eight years old. I remember that uh, when he passed, I would just tell, like, try to just tell myself that he was on a business trip and he'd be back. And that was my way to cope with it. I don't want to get into it too much. But I wouldn't be crying unless he was awesome. He was the best. Also interesting, it was a couple weeks ago, I was just hanging out. I heard Robin Williams come through. And he acknowledged that he was going to come through at some point. And so it's interesting because I've, throughout this, I've always had like a weird kind of a connection mentally with you and him. Like I've placed them together odd enough. Mm -hmm. um, but when he did come through, it was very brief and it was almost like he was going to try to come through again. How close of a relationship did you have to him or did you did you know him? I knew him and he was somebody that I saw a lot when I was much younger. Right. Um, I met him when I was a child and then he did comedy at this, uh, comedy club that I lived across the street from. Right. So uh, he was very famous at that point. And, you know, his death was really, I think, hard for the entire comedy right. community. I, you know, I, I knew him as, as, as most people kind of knew him, but then I knew him a little personally. And I think that he was also kind of unknowable. Sure. That he was very difficult to connect yeah. with on a, a personal level because he was uh, very shy. He was a bit embarrassed by his own fame. Right. And his own, uh, largesse because he he people would freak out when right. they'd see him for me personally what robin williams always did was he, there was like a tough lessons because he would always um bump me at the comedy club so i would have to go on after him and that's how i learned how to do comedy is bombing after him for my entire childhood i was really a child doing comedy but i had to go on after him it was so terrible I learned incredibly well from him. So, I, I mean, I, I, I think that was the greatest gift. I have another woman that's coming through who's acknowledging, like, no, I didn't live even remotely close to a full life. 
and that's the one that I'm really kind of interested in because Great. this person's showing me a big red flag. Okay. That always indicates this is me, this is me, this is me. Like I have a big message to I'm deliver. I'm curious. Okay. Okay. We're gonna talk about some things. There's actually a lot kind of coming through with this one. Mm -hmm. Oh God, there's like a bunch of ones. I'm so sorry. Give me one it's sec. Okay. <laughs> that, 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 I'm like, <laughs> the way this is being conveyed is I have this younger individual that would be like a sibling. This person died way too soon because of the amount of life that they had. But um, the way that this is coming across mm -hmm. is that I feel I have to call this an incident or an event. I feel like you're touching on something, sure. the most important thing. Sure. Reason that I'm here. From her perspective, I feel completely fine. She's acknowledging that after she died, she's referencing to conflict in the way that this comes across. Mm -hmm. Like there was some hardcore negativity after I died. And from her perspective, there's still a lack of a release because of this. That so. makes a lot of sense. That's probably my sister, Debbie. Okay. Um, she passed away when she was 40 years old. There's always been a mystery of her death. I think anytime someone dies young, you just wonder. You wonder what happened, what could have gone wrong. And for me, I just, I haven't been able to understand it. To a lot of people, it's very mysterious. Sure. I've talked it out, I've asked a lot of questions. Sure. And I get a lot of different answers and... Sure, sure. I don't know why she's emphasizing a public place. Yeah, she did pass at a, at a, at a pretty public place. Yeah, you're right. Um, there, there's a lake that they would go camping at okay. all the time. Sure, okay. And she ended up passing right. there. She's acknowledging she was not conscious when she passed, okay. which I'll say, but okay. um, this comes through as an accident. It does. It does, but an accident with non-natural elements to it. I'm really very, very, very <sighs> curious about this. I remember thinking that it was a heart attack, then I heard that it was a spider bite, then I heard she had asthma. Hmm. You know, I think that's just one of those situations because she didn't know how she passed. So there's how no, how, what is she gonna say? You know what I mean? That's, that's kind of the thing. From her perspective, she just went to sleep. Passings that occur under unexplainable circumstances or where there's an air of mystery can be really difficult for families to have a sense of closure about. In reality, on the other side, people acknowledge less of a significance on their final moments and put more of an emphasis on their life. So on their end, they're generally at peace and have closure, even when they don't completely understand what happened to them. The frustration for my sister is what tears me apart. Yeah. That's what I cry about. Sure. It's like when someone passes, it's normal to go through a period, I think, of like, you know, high intense emotions. Mm -hmm. But she's like saying, no, this has been going on since I passed away. There's just a frustration with it to the point where it's like, I want it to get dropped. I don't want people to worry about it. Like, for her, she doesn't want her entire life being equated to that mystery of her death. This is kind of strange. Okay, what would this be? Family member. That's so weird. There's another situation within your family. If I'm interpreting this correctly, um, do you have a biological mom? And I have a biological mom and a um, adoptive mom. Oh, best. Best. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So, can I ask a question? Sure. So, my biological um, mother, there was a secret around my adoption. Okay. And my mother, Rhoda, the one that mm -hmm. we're referring to, Rhoda um, basically would never tell me the truth about my adoption. And she died not wanting me ever to know about my biological mother. Like, what's the secret right. that she was holding on to? That's what I can't figure out. Sure. I spent a long time searching on this, hiring private investigators, right. uh, doing my own homework. There, I really couldn't ever figure out why was she afraid sure. to allow me to know that family and what happened. Right. To, to be honest, um, when I'm connecting to biological mom's energy, there is an acknowledgement when I'm going to the brain and mental of what indicates maybe an undiagnosed mental disorder. If we have a parent who, for example, is a paranoid schizophrenic, and I'm not saying that's necessarily the case, but if we have a parent who is, to tell their child, hey, your mom was a paranoid schizophrenic, can scare the out of that child. Because that child will think, oh my god, what age am I going to develop paranoid schizophrenia? What age am I, is it going to happen to me? When am I going to be like my mom? The feeling is basically not wanting to expose you to this individual. I hate to put this, there could have been some genetic factors when it comes to mental illness within family on your mom's side mm -hmm. that maybe we didn't want everyone to fully know about. So she's protecting 
is what you're saying. Is from her perspective, she views it as her protecting you. Mm -hmm. No matter how that was received on your end, the feeling is like I was protecting her because I knew that her mom was, was a lot worse mentally in what she had to go through than she even fully was aware of.